Ruben Salazar was one of the most renowned Mexican-American journalists of the 20th century. As a writer for the Los Angeles Times and a news director of a Spanish-language television station, he was the bridge connecting disparate segments of a city in a time of change. Ruben said, I have a problem with the LAPD. I said, what are they going to do to you? Put some dope in your car and have you arrested, you know? He says, well, I have a feeling they're more serious than that. His is a story of personal struggle, cultural conflict, and an untimely death. This is the story of the life and mysterious death of Ruben Salazar. I'd like to start with you, Felix, and talk a little bit about your work uh, over at USC with your students, looking into some of the archives. What Salazar's work has done is give us a snapshot of what the story was about Latinos in media and about the uh, stories of the times that he was telling, which was a period of a transition from Mexican America to Chicano. And as Phillips' film makes so clear, he's become an icon, he's become a martyr. He's a larger than life person uh, in after death than he was in life. And so what I did with a group of students and a more technically savvy faculty member than I, uh, Roberto Hernandez, is have students go in through about the 10 plus boxes of papers, files, photographs, pictures, clips, things like this, and tell them what do you see in Ruben Salazar's life and times that relates to you today? How did he become a United States citizen? Well, not surprising to probably many people in this world, uh, or in this room even, uh, the INS lost a lot of his uh, paperwork. The military told him, if you sign up for the army, you join the army, you automatically become a citizen. So he went into the army and he said, no, it's, uh, you have to go to El Paso. So he, wrote, he was in Germany. He writes the immigration officer in El Paso, who he'd originally started with, and the uh, immigration tells him, uh, you can't become a citizen because you're not in the country. You're in Germany. And he says, yeah, well, the government sent me to Germany. I'm in the army. And they said, well, when you can make it back to El Paso, then you can come back and see us. So it's those kinds of things that students saw that they found. Uh, Philip, I'd like to turn to you for a minute, kind of thinking about some of these points that... Um, Thank you, Gustavo. Um, Thank you. ...that Felix is bringing up here. Could you tell us a little bit about why you chose to make this documentary about Salazar? Uh, why did I do this? Uh, I did it because it was a story that had was, I felt that had not been done justice, that it was a story that was a marvelous story about a lot of things, and it had been kind of reduced to a story of grievance, victimology, this poor guy gets shot and martyrdom. And I thought that was, I, I, I just intuited that that was a very narrow and a way of, I mean, it cheated him of his d dynamism, his, 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 his process, his inner life, his psychology. And so I, I wanted to make a three-dimensional portrayal of a person, of a Latino, living in L.A. at that point in history. And um, so in, in what, did, what, was the, what, was, what was surprising was the degree of difficulty. When there, there was a fundamentally very little in the way of records. I had the benefit of Professor Gutierrez and his vast knowledge on the subject and a few others that were available to me. But ultimately, there was nothing in the way of a record. You know, there was the, the papers, uh, you know, the clippings from the newspaper, uh, basically. And there was nothing else. And, Regrettably, it's very qu quite difficult to make history of anything if you don't have any resources. So with the great intrepid producer here in the front row, Jennifer Kobzik, who we bulldogged and didn't take no for an answer, we were scared of nobody, and with our lawyers from Maldef, we went after people who both friend and foe to dig out images, Super 8 footage, uh, whatever it is we could cobble together. There was virtually nothing um, to, make a, to make a program. And, uh, it was a labor of incredible madness, love, and, um, and uh, a, a very worthwhile thing to do. Well, uh, Gustavo, why don't we bring you in here since um, you can give us a little bit of perspective. I wonder about your um, thoughts 
on uh, the documentary, thinking about kind of your own experiences. Salazar, after he became a martyr, he just really became a face that you see on murals. He became somebody that you read. There was nothing to the man that people ask. Like if you ask most people, who's Ruben Salazar? Oh, he was a columnist for the LA Times who got killed, but that was it. So when I was, uh, when I was an undergrad, I got, um, it's, a, it's an anthology of Salazar's columns called Border Correspondent, released by UC Press. And I remember thinking, okay, this is gonna be this amazing radical, like Rudy Acuna, like total Chicano studies text. And I was just blown away at how, not I don't wanna say mainstream, but just how objective Salazar was at the beginning, and you saw, and in some, of the, in some of the cases, he openly said, oh, you know, these Chicano kids, they should really be more American. They should be a little bit more mainstream. Here's this Chicano radical debunked, and it wasn't until the very end, and this documentary shows it perfectly, that Salazar, I don't, I mean, Philip and his family could say a little bit more to him, and Felix too, I don't know if he necessarily considered himself a radical ever, if not a journalist who saw a community being ostracized, being brutalized, and being stereotyped, and Ruben took it on his, as his responsibility to tell the stories that weren't being told and fighting power. Just a quick follow-up question for you, Gustavo, and then I really will let the audience chime in, but uh, a lot of students here are interested in pursuing careers in media and journalism. I wonder if you can talk just a little bit about your own career trajectory. Uh, just, you know, thinking also about not just what Ruben Salazar was covering, but the importance of his own career, right? As a uh, Chicano, nascently conscious Chicano coming up through the ranks. Well, I, I think it's sad. So in 1970, Ruben Salazar is writing these columns for the Los Angeles Times. Nowadays, neither the LA Times nor the Orange County Register has a Chicano columnist or even a Latina columnist telling these stories. I'm the only columnist in Southern California telling these stories, and Ask a Mexican is not Ruben Salazar, <laughs> not, not nowhere near it. All this said, how did I become a reporter? Very simple. I wrote an angry letter to the editor. I'm not going to get into the whole story just because it takes very long, but really briefly, when I went to school, I went to Chapman University, I was in film studies. I thought I was going to be a, a librarian with the Academy of Motion Pictures Art and Sciences Library. I was just going to be helping out students for the rest of my life. Then I discovered the OC Weekly, the OC Weekly, this crazy newspaper that was telling all these stories about police brutality, about corruption in City Hall, great bands, great food, but they didn't have any Latinos telling any stories whatsoever. The, at the OC Weekly, it was basically Huntington Beach, Irvine, Costa Mesa, and that was it. Santana didn't exist, Anaheim didn't exist, Little Saigon didn't exist. So when I, when I wrote an angry letter to the editor, the editor said, hey, you have a really great voice. You want to start telling stories for us? And I told him, well, I'm not a reporter. I had no training whatsoever. Long story short, that was April 2000. Here we are. Uh, 2014, I'm the editor of the paper. I became the editor in 2011. So in 11 years, I went from a crazy ranting college student into the boss of the damn thing. How I got there was once I realized that I wanted to be a reporter, I committed my life to becoming a reporter. I committed my life to basically not having a life other than the story. So if you really want to be a journalist, uh, and all of us here can tell you right now, it's a great time to be a journalist and it's a very bad time to be a journalist. The jobs are shrinking. The job market is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and all these important stories are not being told. But if you have the wherewithal, the ganas, if we want to call it, to be bilingual, if you have the ganas to tell great stories, if you have the ganas to be able to go out there and raise hell, there will always be a job for you. What motivates me? Three words, don't get beat. Do not get beaten by anyone. You do the story first. If you can't do the story first, then you better do a spectacular thing that's gonna beat the other person. If you wanna be real reporters, it's all about conquest. It's all about being, destroying the competition, frankly. And I'm sorry if I'm sounding like a war general, but that's absolutely what journalism is about. No fluffy stories, you tell the story first. It doesn't all have to be police procedural stuff, cultural stuff. You be the first people to tell the story of this amazing band. As, as usual, Gustavo nailed it. Mo the, mo the moment of motivation when I really understood I was going to do this film about Salazar was some hack at the LA Times that had been writing something every year on the anniversary, wah, 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 wanker. Uh, I, said, I told him I wanted to do a film about Ruben Salazar. He goes, he looked, you know, wa you know panicked. That's my story. And, you know, at that point, I, I said, if I leave Ruben in the hands of this, the likes of this kind of person, it's never going to be done. It's going to go in circles, you know, and... Uh, and that 
that kind of uh, competitive feeling that I'm going to be the guy to get it out of the box. It may not be the last, but it'd probably be the best for a hell of a long time. Short advice. Get it first, get it right, but get it first. And Salazar, obviously, is an inspiration. He gave his life doing what he loved, which is speaking truth to power. And whether you want to believe that Salazar was targeted for assassination or not, the truth, you know, fact of the matter is that the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department and the police did not like what Salazar was doing. How many of you are willing to risk, really, your life and your comfort in targeting people in positions of power? Very few. Salazar was one of them. And for me, that's an inspiration every single day. And also, as uh, you know, child of Mexican immigrants, uh, Salazar for me t teaches me, first and foremost, you don't want to be labeled as a Mexican reporter. You do that consciously, but you never let them label you. In fact, the great journalist Sam Quinones, when I first started as a reporter, I asked him for advice and he said, don't let them pigeonhole you. All your bosses are always going to want to want you to tell Mexican stories and Mexican stories alone because you're Mexican. Tell those stories if you want to, but tell other stories as well. Salazar, again, he you know, he became an icon of telling stories of the Chicano movement, but he was a foreign correspondent. He was in Vietnam. He was talking about police brutality. For him, it was a story and the story alone that matter, and that it happened to be toward the end of his life a lot about the Chicano community. That was important to him because no one was covering him. I think if he was a white man as well, he'd have that same conviction in telling those stories. He also started when he was a college student. He started telling the truth to power when he was a student at what is now UT El Paso. So you don't have to wait. Journalism is not a career where you have to wait until you graduate, get a degree, get a certificate, have a credential or whatever to start. The, way, the, the minute you start doing something, you're doing it for real. It's not mark, mock court. It's not a pretend case study like business schools. You're covering real stories for real people that are being read by real folks. And Salazar started young, and he, he stayed that on that trend through his life. And so you can do it. Don't wait till you graduate. Why Ruben Salazar? It's one of the great, it's a great American story. A story that had been largely neglected. And, uh, and I felt like the people that could tell the story well were dying and fading. And if I didn't do it now, it would be lost to history. What do you think that Salazar's death affected the Latino community at that time and now? Well, in 1970, when Ruben Salazar was killed by a Los Angeles deputy sheriff, he was the most widely known Latino in Los Angeles other than a few Hollywood figures. He was known both by the Anglo community through his writing in the LA Times, and he was known in the Latino Spanish speaking community because of his work of KMEX. And he was the only one that was really bringing the two worlds together. We didn't have elected politicians, except for Ed Royval in Los Angeles, nobody on the city council, board of supervisors, no visibility in the media, no you know, TV, they were just starting to hire a few Latinos. So he was a, a loud and sound and uh, persuasive voice, effective voice to two worlds. And we lost that. And I think we're still suffering from that, from having a large communities that don't really know each other. So do you have a personal connection to who Ruben Salazar was? Yeah, I knew Ruben Salazar. When I was in college at Cal State LA 50 years ago, I was studying journalism and I would read his stories in the LA Times. and think, wow, that's, he's writing the kind of stuff I'd like to be able to write because it wasn't the crime, it wasn't the gang, it wasn't the Cinco de Mayo, it was going deeper than that. And then uh, later, so he was a role model to me. I go on journalism school, get my degree, and when I came out, I, I couldn't get a job in journalism. So I started doing activism work, press relations for pickets, protests, demonstrations, sit-ins, marches, the things we were doing in the late 60s to get educational access for Latinos. And so Salazar was the guy you talked to at the LA Times if you wanted to get something in. So I got to, to know him professionally, and I'd pitch him stories. Some he would take, some he wouldn't. And then I left LA. I figured, I was, I figured out in 1969 it just wasn't working out. So I would go into higher education. So I took a job at Stanford when they were just starting to let uh, Chicanos into Stanford. And about the second or third day I'm on campus, I get this phone call from L.A. and it's Ruben Salazar. And he says, Felix, how come you didn't tell me you were leaving town? I said, well, I'm just up here doing what I was telling you about at Cal State L.A., you know, getting Chicanos into college, you know. And he says, yeah, well, when Stanford does it, it's news. 
kind of like, you know, I couldn't do every story you did there, but now that Stanford's doing it, you know. I know. So he wrote a kind of a local boy makes good wow. story about me. A few months later, I sent him uh, a, a story, that uh, re research done by Ralph Guzman on um, high Chicano deaths in Vietnam. And he did a story with that too. So uh, we had some personal connection, first as a role model and then a professional relationship. I don't claim to have been his best friend, <laughs> but I did know him.